let's um, move on to our third of our six paper presentations today by Armanek Petrosian of Georgia Tech. And he's going to talk about neural network integral representations with the ReLU activation function. Yeah. Hello, thank you for the introduction. And uh, I hope you can hear me well. Okay, excellent. All right, so thank you very much for the introduction, for the invitation. So this is uh, joint work with Anton Zirvensov, who is at the Lirio AI Research currently, and Clayton Webster, who is uh, also at Lirio AI Research, and also he's uh, at the Department of Mathematics at UT Knoxville. Uh, I have one, one slide at the very end, who is with, uh, which is with Konstantin uh, Pieper, and he is at the ORNL. So all of this work, all the material in this presentation was conducted at the Oak Ridge National Lab and all of us were working there. Um, okay, so, um, all right, so what is my talk about? So we, uh, okay, I'll start with defining what shell neural network is. Shell neural network in our case is a function from the RD to R and it has the inner weights A and BN and has outer weights CN. And in our case, we think we'll take the ReLU activation function and make the observation that we can assume that our weights AN and BN are on the unit sphere in RD times R. We can do that because ReLU is uh, scale invariant. So we can pull the norm out and then incorporate it into the outer weight CN. Okay, so uh, having that in mind, we define the integral neural networks, uh, which are functions of the, the form presented in the uh, in, the, in the slide. So it integrates the sigma AX plus B against a write-on measure on SD of, uh, of so a write-on measure which has a uh, finite total variation on. So this function is well-defined and it is, we think of it as a generalization of the finite neural network. So there are two ways we can think of it as we can think of it also as the, like I said, we can, we can think of it as uh, basically when this, we discretize in this kind of integral, we end up with a shell ne network, but we prefer to think of it as a, as a mathematical framework for looking at the finite, ne finite uh, shell neural networks. And it will be apparent, uh, especially at the last slide of my presentation, why this is, this is, uh, this is the way we look at it. Okay, so the, the in the paper that we presented for the conference, we think of the, uh, we, we look at the measures which are absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue measure on the unit sphere. And so we are, we have target function f and we're trying to represent it in the integral form. So here, uh, the new uh, is basically absolutely continuous with respect to new d, uh, the, the Lebesgue measure and the condition that is finite total variation becomes that the coefficients, the outer weights are in L1. And so what we, what we wanted to do is characterize the functions that can be represented in this form and if we have a function that has that form, is it possible to find the coefficient C? And is it possible to find the one that has the smallest L1 more? And uh, for the D, D equal one case in the, in the paper, we presented uh, the, fin uh, the complete characterization. And uh, so it, when D is equal one, the integral representation that we had here uh, turns into the following representation after uh, um, parameterizing in terms of the angle. And uh, to give the characterization, we define this space WR, which, uh, which basically are functions who have certain decay and certain level of smoothness. Uh, and the characterization theorem says that uh, if we have a function which is representable in the desired integral form, then F can be written as a, some function GX from the space WR of like rapidly decaying functions, plus some linear term and plus another term, which is kind of like linear. So this is actually interesting because it feels like, like the ReLU is kind of appearing here. Uh, uh, sorry, ResNet is kind of appearing here in terms of this uh, linear factor here. And uh, another, uh, and then conversely, if we have any function which has this form with GX in WR, then F can be represented in the integral form, in the desired integral form, and we can compute all the coefficients C uh, in the following form. So it depends on the second derivative of F and plus uh, this K, which is kind of the kernel and plus the, uh, the, 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 the part which corresponds to this linear, linear terms. So this, this theorem completely characterizes all the, all the solutions, all the functions that are representable in our form. Okay, so uh, as a corollary from this uh, theorem, we can in particular find 
that uh, if we have a function in WR, so WR c contains all compactly supported functions which have second derivatives. And so in particular for any, any such kind of function, the, the least L1, L1 norm solution uh, has exactly this form, depends on the second derivative. Okay, so um, just a disclaimer, so this result was published concurrently with another paper uh, by Onji and Villette, and uh, they kind of published within a few days difference. And so our case covers the one dimensional case. Their result, so in, in a multi dimensional case, we had the formulas for the list L1, but we didn't manage to prove it. Uh, and they actually provided the, the proof for L1. Uh, L, the the, the multi dimensional case also has the least L1 solution. And in this in multi dimensional case, the, the, the formula is a little bit more um, fancier, more complicated. So it involves the Radon transform of the function f and involves the Hilbert transform. Um, so uh, the formula is basically this. So if, if it, when, it, when, when the dimension of the function is odd, we have this uh, representation. Um, basically, the, the CAB in this case ends up being having this form. Um, and uh, when D is odd, there is also the Hilbert transform involved in it. So, um, yeah, so, but in this case, like in the D equal one case, we have this complete characterization in terms of this WR space. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, uh, neither our work, neither the work by the, the other group doesn't have the characterization. So uh, that's still kind of an open question. Uh, the most we could do was the, the compactly supported functions in our case. Um, yeah, so that's another open question. Another question that we, the, this, this whole integral representation paradigm is lacking is the a deep case, basically. Uh, there are a couple of ideas how to do that, but um, in particular involving ResNets, but we don't have a theory for that setting yet. Um, so, uh, uh, so since we're working with the L1, L1 norms, um, there, is, um, there is an interesting observation we can, we can actually make from here, is that we, we, we could, if we're trying to get like sparse networks, we, we could say that, okay, let's, Let's take the CN and put an L1 penalty on the outer coffee, outer weights in the hope that we'll get a sparse network. So a network which has a, a small width and approximates our target function. Um, however, actually this, this theorem kind of implies that your function is smooth. This L1 penalty is going to give you some, some uh, derivative of the, the function. So it's, it's, it's not going to be really a, a compactly supported uh, function. So L1, L1 there are some other arguments why L1 minimization is not really a good choice for the um, sparse or small network to approximate your function. For that, we, we looked at this extension and we found some interesting results here actually. Um, so instead of, uh, there we had the constraint problem. Basically we look at the exact representation with a penalized L1 norm on the outer weights. But here we are looking at the no unconstrained problem. We take our neural network um, so it depends on this uh, measure of bounded total variation, subtract from F and compute the fidelity in terms of this probability measure on the domain of F. And, and on, on top of that, we add the penalty phi. So if phi was uh, uh, basically, the, the form of phi is, is the following form, it, it penalizes the outer weights. If this penalty function phi was the uh, absolute value, we get end up with the L1 norm. And uh, in our case, we look at non-convex function. The class of function that we look at includes the log penalty function or the MSP function. And uh, I want to point out that this, if this, this probability new has, there's no restriction on it. So this probability new can be a Lebesgue measure, can be discrete measure. So discrete measure will correspond to the finite data set case. So it can actually be uh, any measure. So potentially we are fitting an infinitely large data set. And uh, the interesting result here, which I kind of like, is that uh, all, this, all the local solutions of problem five, all local solutions are finitely supported. So when we solve this problem with any method, we end up with local solution, they're going to be finite. It's not like your network is going to grow, 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 which, uh, which can happen in case of the L1 penalty because we saw that the solution of the L1 problem can be potentially uh, uh, infinitely support function. And on top of that, the local, local solutions of these five, all the local solutions uh, uh, have, uh, have very nice uh, approximation properties. 
And in, in particular, this, this uh, fidelity term is bounded by some constant CF, which only depends on the function F. It doesn't depend on dimension or anything else times the alpha. So alpha is our um, kind of trade-off for the uh, fidelity and the sparsity. So we, in our experiments, we took alpha to be like 0 0.005. So the error can be potentially very small. So basically with this penalty, the local minimizers are going to be have, to, to have like really nice properties and you don't really, you're not really concerned even like looking for, I mean, obviously don't look for the global minimizers, but you don't even worry about like bad local minimizers. And, and like I said, the, the finite support comes uh, for free. And we have an algorithm for uh, building this network and, um, and uh, it can be found in our recently posted paper. Uh, yeah, to wrap it up, we don't have results for deep case. Uh, that's an ongoing work. And uh, uh, for us, the natural extension was the non-convex uh, uh, setting. And uh, I only included these three papers here. Obviously, there are a lot more related works. And, uh, and uh, I will refer to this paper and also to refer to our paper submitted to the MSML for the further references. Um, so I think my time is up, kind of. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank well, you. Let's, let's go ahead and answer one question now. Um, we have a couple minutes. Okay. Someone asks, what is the main difficulty in generalizing these results to multiple layer neural networks? Uh, so it, it heavily relies on the uh, on the kind of the linearity set. like the, the outer weights are kind of become linear uh, provide linear representation for the function and so for example solving this uh, problem number five we have uh, used like a generalized conjugate gradient method which uh, I don't I'm not sure really how to do that in a, in the way we do it in a, in a deep case and also, the finding these formulas, um, uh, yeah, with, with just because of the uh, uh, composition operation, it, it becomes a little more complicated uh, to like solving like least L1 problem or what is even like the proper least L1 problem. And uh, yeah, just the framework is not really well formulated yet for us. Uh, I hope I answered your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much.